It was 25 years ago that the Nobel Committee named Dr. Michael Smith of UBC as the winner in chemistry. It's a prize he won for his work in site-directed mutagenesis. In other words, a process of making specific changes to the DNA sequence of a gene, a process that Dr. Smith developed in advance of the mapping of the human genome. He was a remarkable scientist and a remarkable man who went to great lengths in attracting research talent to BC. He devoted the entire prize money he was awarded to future research. And in doing so, he played a vital role in establishing BC as a center for excellence in genome research. His generosity of spirit, coupled with his financial contribution, has inspired the creation of Genome BC. The Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research, the Michael Smith Laboratories at UBC, and the Michael Smith Genome Sciences Center at BC Cancer. The Nobel Prize and Dr. Smith's commitment to using his position to advance research in BC was a game changer, one that vaulted local scientists onto the world stage and put British Columbia on the map as a place of world-class research. We invited distinguished scientist Mark O'Mara, the director of Canada's Michael Smith Genome Sciences Centre at the BC Cancer Agency, to join us for a conversation that matters about the remarkable legacy of Dr. Michael Smith. Conversations That Matter is a partner program for the Centre for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. It's been just over 25 years since Michael Smith was awarded the Nobel Prize. Where were you at that moment? Uh, well, when Michael was being awarded the Nobel Prize, I was a, a graduate student uh, studying for my PhD at Simon Fraser University. Uh, and at the time, uh, we, we had been looking at the genes, the genetic code of a, a tiny little worm a soil nematode called Cineraptitis elegans. And I, oh, and I remember okay. that yeah. thing, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The roundworm, some people call it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so that's what I was up to, uh, very esoteric sorts of things. But at that point in your career, did you believe that you could have the kind of research career that you've been able to realize in British Columbia? Because the landscape was entirely different then than it is now. And I think that a lot of that credit goes back to Michael Smith. The, the landscape is incredibly different. Uh, yeah. It's incomparable, actually. At that particular time, uh, genome science didn't exist, and uh, it wasn't part of the Canadian scientific uh, language, if mm -hmm. you like. So I was very interested in understanding the DNA of my favorite little tiny worm, uh, and so were a bunch of other people. And around that time, uh, it was made, a decision was made by the United States National Human Genome Research Institute and also uh, an organization, the Wellcome Trust uh, in, in England, that uh, C. elegans, this worm, would be an initial early target for the Human Genome Project. For full sequencing. For full sequencing. Mm -hmm. And I thought this was just amazing. It was an amazing thing. Here we were standing at the front edge of the Human Genome Project and we would have the opportunity now to learn how to decode the DNA in some systematic and powerful and high throughput way and we would understand enough about the process that we could take that process forward into the human genome. Mm -hmm. That was the fantasy at the time. And I remember writing an application uh, to the Canadian government um, to fund me as a, a postdoctoral researcher. This is what happens after you get your PhD, yeah. you do more stuff, more right. studies. Uh, to go down to St. Louis, where one of the two labs that would be doing this was located. Uh, and I got a, a thing back from uh, the reviewers of my application who said, this isn't science. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's how early it was in the process. It they didn't early. even realize that the sequencing of the human genome was underway and that there were roles that we could play in, 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 in uncovering many of those mysteries. That's right, yeah, yeah. Wow. early days. Well, then that also speaks a little bit more to the extraordinary value of the work of Michael Smith, that he was able to then take, you know, to, to narrow down 
the ability to target specific elements of the genome to mutate them, doing this in a vacuum because there was no full sequencing of the, the, the human genome or any other. That's right. Uh, well, there were a few yeah. little tiny uh, microbial things that had been done yeah. and, and led the way forward. Uh, and Michael um, and his discovery happened along at a, a particular period of time when we, we as a scientific community really might not have realized the full power of his discovery. And a lot of mm -hmm. discoveries are, are, are like that, true, real discoveries. And so Michael's, uh, and I'm I'm suspecting a lot here, I'm, I'm extrapolating, yeah. I don't have the evidence here, but you know, if Michael uh, were sitting there thinking about what DNA means, he would have said, well, you know, DNA is the genetic code, and he knew that, and the genetic code uh, has alterations in it all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, in cancer, for example, we have alterations of the genetic code, and that makes the cancer a cancer. And so Michael probably appreciated, quite clearly, at least in his own mind, that the ability to change arbitrary letters in the genetic code would allow one to understand what the function of the genetic code actually did. If I make this change, do I get cancer? If I make this change, do I create a superbug? If I make this change, what happens? But Very he was examining all those elements in isolation. It, it was part of a community, of course, because yeah. no Nobel Prize or any other significant achievement in, in science is ever completely in isolation. Yeah. You know, we have this idea of the uh, the scientist as somebody in a white coat in a dingy basement under a naked light bulb waiting for the eureka moment. <laughs> and it's, it's actually really not like that. Um, there are communities of individuals who are working together and sharing their information through their publications all the time. So Michael was able to define a very important problem Mm -hmm. which has subsequently created amazing opportunities. But he did it not really in a vacuum. He, right. he did it in the context of a, a body of science that had been funded and published for years before him. And we all are like that. We all take advantage of where our predecessors have come from and the information that they generate, and we use that to make the next discovery. I'm thinking about what you were saying, like you're trying to do your postdoctoral research and you get denied funding because people go, well, that's not science. And, and so then what do you start thinking, well, well, what are the opportunities ahead of me here in Vancouver? And, but, but by now, Michael Smith has been awarded the Nobel Prize. Did everything start to change for, for you and for the research community here in British Columbia as a result of that? I, ultimately, yes, and within a fairly short time frame uh, in my own personal experience. So although I was denied funding, uh, I, I phoned up my supervisor, mm -hmm. said, you know, that application didn't go very well, and he mm -hmm. said, you come anyway. Uh, and so I went down to St. Louis and worked there for a period of about five and a half years until one day I get a phone call. And the phone call uh, was from a fellow named Victor Ling, who was the vice president of research uh, at the BC Cancer Agency. And he told me, after introducing himself, because I didn't know who he was, and he's a very famous scientist in his own right, he said, well, you know, Michael Smith is going to come and work with us at, at BC Cancer to set up a genome center. And it's going to be the first one in the world that's focused specifically on cancers and housed within a cancer hospital. So Michael and his ability to move into that space, although he wasn't you know, a cancer biologist, the power that he lent to that created an opportunity mm -hmm. that the donor base in BC could get behind. And I didn't believe it. The first time I heard this, I said, I don't believe you. <laughs> really? I was quite cheeky, actually. Yeah. I said, you know, Canada doesn't know what it takes. I came from there, I know. I was wrong. But does this not then come back to what you just said about the power of uh, Michael Smith and yes. the weight of the Nobel Prize? Yes, yeah. and the kind of guy that Michael was. Yeah. Because he was, you know, he was an individual who thought about issues larger than himself. Uh -huh. I thought uh, when I knew him, which was not a long period of time, that he used uh, the recognition that the prize had afforded him in ways that uh, spoke to uh, you know a higher social conscience. It wasn't about him. It was about where the field needed to go. It reminded me of Banting. Was he not a similar kind of uh, scientist that he saw beyond? <laughs> yeah. We, of course, we don't know I him. I didn't know him, yeah. But when you read the stories of Banting, it's like, Holy smokes, this was an extraordinary human being. Yes. And so was Michael Smith. So was Michael Smith. So he starts to get behind this. He took $500,000, the $500,000 prize, and dedicated it to research. What did that foster? Um, 
when we take a look at what we have now, how do you describe it and you know, build back to that moment when Michael Smith said, okay, we're gonna do this. So Michael's uh, gift was, was an important signal, uh, not only reflecting the kind of man that he was, mm -hmm. uh, which I think one would characterize as extraordinarily generous, but he also realized the catalytic power of investment. Mm -hmm. And through that investment, he shone a light on this thing called research. Uh, he supported women in science. He did all these things that were you know, a little bit ahead of the curve at the time. Uh, using the prize to shine light on issues that mattered to him, largely, you know, social issues. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think about uh, his impact in the larger sense, in the larger sense, since his uh, his passing, I mean, he started the Genome Sciences Center with a twenty-five million dollar commitment from uh, our citizens here in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. And so that enterprise today uh, claims to have generated more than a billion dollars in research funding that's come to our jurisdiction. And we saw the recent announcement of the super funding from the federal government and the number of those projects that were based here in BC. That's all an extension of that same you know, arc of events, isn't it? Michael was very important in shining attention to what was going on here in BC, bringing investment into BC and catalyzing opportunity for a bunch of people like me, you know, kids in our 30s or whatever, coming back from here, there, and all over the place. And there's a, a bunch of people that he mm -hmm. brought back who have done exceptional science uh, and are world-recognized experts in their fields. So Michael's impact was everywhere. So are we really doing exceptional science? Because I think as Canadians, especially way out here on the West Coast, we think, yeah, okay, we think it's pretty good. But is it really? Like when we take a look at the work that is centered around now Genome BC and the, you know, by extension to BC Cancer and so on, are we doing world-class work? We are. So there's a large body of individuals in, in our immediate domain that do fantastic research. They don't do it with very much and they don't do nearly as much as they might if they were supported at, at higher levels. Mm -hmm. But there is wonderful stuff going on. It's, I think it's really important to understand in the academic sense how, how we as professors uh, function. So as a, as a research scientist, if you're not producing world-leading results, you don't have a job. And you're not gonna get your grant funded and you're not gonna be able to do the work. You have to be able to show that you're doing world-leading stuff. This concept of excellence is embedded within how the academic functions. Mm -hmm. How do you prove that you're doing world-leading stuff? Well, other people have to say so, and those other people are people you don't know. So every time you write a grant, you say, I'd like some money to do some work, and you submit that to a granting body. In the peer review system, the granting body sends that out to people you don't know who they consider to be leaders in the field. And they ask them, what do you think? Why should we not fund this? Why should we not fund it? Sure, what are the holes? What are the weaknesses? Mm -hmm. What's the problem? And so in that system, what tends to happen is uh, very powerful critiques are made. Some of them are politically motivated. Many of them are scientifically motivated. It's not perfect, but it's a great system that ensures only some of the work gets funded. Uh, but there's a whole lot of really great work that's left on the table that never gets done because we're only funding five, ten percent of all the applications that we may see in this in this particular system. Mm -hmm. So if we funded the top thirty percent or twenty percent, some arbitrary number that is greater than five or ten, mm -hmm. you would have more great science. So that's the situation we're in. We do great stuff at the top edge of stuff. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's it's powerful. It's impactful. We could do so much more. Gordon McCauley of the CDRD says, you know, we really do punch above our weight here in Canada. We've got a, you know, based on, you know, pure numbers, we're a very small portion of the scientific population globally. Yes. And yet we're producing upwards of four or five percent of overall uh, research that is moving towards actual developments. How, because, you know, we're focusing on the legacy of Michael Smith. Yeah. How much of that is attributable to him and the community that we've now created? Because, you know, you don't grow up saying, okay, I'm going to be a world leading scientist unless you believe that there is a possibility in the, in the, you know, the country or the area that you live and get educated in. Yeah. So, so Michael's influence is, is very important uh, to think about 
not only his, but the community of people mm -hmm. that he touched, that he wanted to work with, the examples that he set, his legacy. You know, we, we, when we look at all of that, uh, you are left with the inescapable conclusion that the landscape that we have today is tied to the legacy of Michael Smith. There is no doubt about that. Yeah. There's no doubt. I mean, I come into my office every day and there's a plaque uh, that was gifted to the Genome Sciences Center. There's an image of Michael on the plaque. I look at him every day, every day. We have the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research. We have Canada's Michael Smith Genome Sciences Center. We have, uh, you know, the labs at UBC. We have all this legacy around us. And mm -hmm. all of that is striving for excellence, striving to be relevant, striving to understand basic fundamental problems of biology that improve the human condition. What are some of those ones that we have now started to realize since Michael's work? And I know that we're still really early days in, in, in truly being able to harness the, 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 the power that comes with having sequenced the human genome. You know, <laughs> there was this sense that, well, now that we've done it, we'll just make, make changes. Well, no, that only just get started to give us the roadmap to start to be able to examine whether we can and can't do certain things. But what are some of those milestones that we can look at already and yeah. say, that makes an extraordinary difference in the lives of a lot of people. Sure. And so there, there's all kinds of examples from various aspects of disease research. And so I'm a cancer researcher. Mm -hmm. Let me just talk briefly about, uh, about cancer and malignancy. So what we know about cancer uh, from the perspective of the genome is that it's alterations in the genome that seem to be associated with the underpinnings of cancer. How does cancer start? There's some alteration in the genome someplace. How does cancer grow? Some alteration in the genome someplace. How does cancer come back after you treat it? Alterations in the genome someplace. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the direct consequence of being able to read out all those changes, in effect, gives us the opportunity to say, what are the broken pieces in cancer? What regions of the DNA become broken? Why do those regions, when broken, cause ovarian cancer or breast cancer or lymphoma? brain cancer, what is it about those regions? Mm -hmm. We would never have known to look in a particular region of the genome unless we could find the broken piece. And we can't find the broken piece just by guessing where it is. We have three billion areas where we could guess. Right. In something like 10 to 100 trillion cells, we could guess about all of that. But instead of guessing, we can now measure it. Mm -hmm. And measurement technology, no matter what field of science you want to talk about, the ability to measure it is fundamental. So if we can find that change, mm -hmm. We have an opportunity to study the function of that change, and if we can study the function of that change, then we know how to interfere with how that change causes malignancy. Could we even stop it before it starts? Are we at that point yet? We are not. No. But as scientists, we have to be optimistic, and we have to fight for a better future for our population. So wouldn't it be wonderful if we could bring all this power forward, understand the changes that are going to cause malignancy, find them before malignancy starts, or manage them at a stage where malignancy is, is always curable. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be wonderful? What a vision that would be. Well, that is the promise that uh, is held in front of us, ha having mapped the human genome. But, you know, as you're, as you're talking, I realize um, when I hear that somebody has cancer now, I used to go, oh my gosh, it's a death sentence. The prognosis has completely changed. In the, in the time since that we're talking about here, the last quarter century, uh, Terry Fox wouldn't have died, for instance. Um, uh, like the world is changing and it's changing yes. quite rapidly. Yes, it is. But there's a lot of work to be done. There is. So what do we need now to be able to continue this uh, legacy of Michael Smith and more importantly, affect, how, create positive outcomes for people who uh, encounter these kinds of health challenges where there is a mutation in the genome that leads to cancer. Where do we go from here? Yeah. So in the, in the cancer context, in my perspective and that of some of my colleagues uh, is that we need to reproducibly and systematically sequence patients. We need to interpret that information very rapidly. Mm -hmm and understand whether anything in that information would allow us to specify a cancer therapy for a patient that would make sense given their own personal genetic makeup. Right. Now, all of us know that we're different. We know this. Mm -hmm. You know, we've re been reading about this for eons now. 
my DNA is different than your DNA, my mom's DNA is different than my dad's DNA, and I'm a hybrid of those two DNA strands. And then your lifestyle uh, contributes to all, all that, sorts the of environment stuff. that you live in, and Tons on and of on and on. on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if I were to guess at, at the three to 10 million changes that you have in your DNA versus my DNA, I couldn't do it, could I? No. There's no way, but I could measure them. Mm -hmm. What we know when we take cancers that are exactly the same and we sequence their DNA, they can be very, very different at the DNA sequence level. It's not all lymphoma. Mm -hmm. It's not all breast cancer. Right. It's not all brain cancer. And we cannot know what the differences are until we measure them. And we cannot think to act on what those differences might be in terms of management of disease unless we measure them. So this path forward for me is, is quite clear. Uh, one way to make a very big impact in cancer right now today in BC, and we could do this, mm -hmm. not tomorrow, not in 10 years, right now, we could do this, would be to systematically sequence the DNA of cancer patients and advise our clinicians on what that DNA might say about what that patient may or may not respond to. Today, not developing a new drug, that's taking the existing drugs that are available and remapping them onto cancer patients based on their and, profiles. And, and then determining how that... Uh, treatment is going to be administered based on their genome and the way that the cancer is interacting with it. I want to give you an example. Yeah. And this is a well-publicized one. I feel comfortable sharing this story with you uh, because it's been shared before. Uh, one of the things that we found when we were examining a particular kind of cancer called colorectal cancer, which had spread all over the patient's body, was that the key vulnerability in that patient's cancer could be attacked by a blood pressure medication. A blood pressure medication? Yeah. And we said, that's the key vulnerability. That's the thing that we must attack. Well, can you imagine? These crazy scientist guys are saying a blood pressure medication. It already exists. It already exists. The safety profile is known. This is not a drug development effort that's going to yield a result $5 billion later in 15. Yeah. There it is. And a very heroic oncologist uh, tested that in the patient and caused their the disease to disappear. And it has remained, disappeared for long periods of time. It's come back and treatment again and goes away. But this is, this is what we can do. That's a dramatic departure from what, what was available even just a couple of years ago. Yeah. The ability to be able to do that. That's right. And, and, and through all of this genome sequencing and the work that we're doing, we move closer and closer and closer to a personalized treatment for each of us. That's right. Don't we? That's, that's the vision. That's the yeah. plan. That's the dream. How to get there in the context of the healthcare system is not so clear, but the science, I think, right. is up to the task of at least getting us started. Thank you very much for sharing this with us. What an extraordinary job.